All right, so let's start talking about the UI kit improvements for iOS 7. So basically, all of our existing iOS controls and views are going to be upgraded to have the look and feel of iOS 7. We're also, we're going to have numerous other new features that we can take advantage of, and some of these include UI kit dynamics that's going to let us mimic real-world effects such as gravity in our animations. We'll have text kit uh, for providing sophisticated text editing and display capabilities. We'll have tint color property which is going to allow us to apply a tint color to a view and all of its subviews. We're going to have a lot of new updates for UI view controllers. We'll have view UI controller transitions that can be customized, driven interactively, or replaced altogether with ones you designate. View controllers can now specify their preferred status bar style and visibility. We we'll have a UI motion effect class, which is going to define the basic behavior for motion events which are objects that define how a view responds to device-based motions. For UI image, we'll be able to select a named image, which is going to allow us to be able to retrieve images stored in asset catalogs. There are going to be methods on UI view and UI screen for creating a snapshot of their contents. We'll have uh, gesture recognizers, can now support dependencies dynamically to ensure that one gest gesture recognizer can fail before another is considered to run. And then also we'll have a UI key command class which is going to wrap keyboard events received from an external hardware keyboard. A few more items that we'll see as far as the UI kit framework. So we've got a UI font descriptor object and that's going to describe a font using a dictionary of attributes. The UI font and UI font descriptor classes also support dynamic text sizing which improves the legibility of text in applications. With this feature the user can control the desired font size that all apps in a system should use. The UI activity class now supports new activity types, including activities for sending items via AirDrop, adding items to a Safari reading list, and posting content to Flickr, uh, Tencent, Weibo, and Vimeo. The UI application delegate protocol adds methods for handling background fetch behaviors. The UI screen edge pan gesture recognizer class is a new gesture recognizer that tracks pan gestures that originate near an edge of the screen. And then we also have UI kit adding support for running in a guided access mode which allows an app to lock itself to prevent modification by the user. This mode is intended for institutions such as schools where users bring their own devices but need to run apps provided by their institution. Also, this would be a good mechanism to teach users how to use an application. State restoration now allows the saving and restoration of an object. Objects adopting the UI state restoring protocol can write out state information when the app moves to the background and have that state restored during a subsequent relaunch. UI table views now support estimating the height of rows and other elements which improves scrolling performance. You can now easily configure a UI search display controller object to work with a UI navigation bar object. So what about Xcode? Overall Xcode is going to match the new look that we see from iOS 7. So if you're used to using Xcode as your design surface then you're going to see an overall look that's going to 
match iOS 7. And you'll also notice as you look at your controls, do previews on them, that they, in the design surface, will match what you'll see with iOS 7. So one of the questions that comes up, well, what changes are there for my existing controls? And, you know, while existing controls are pretty much all the same, there are small changes. Just looking at this from a high level view, how you interact with them from the developer or the design standpoint, if you use Xcode as your existing design surface, you'll continue to use Xcode. If you work with your controls programmatically, if you put them on your view um, programmatically, then you can continue to do the exact same thing. So as I said, all of the views in UIKit conform to the new look and feel of iOS. Well, let's talk about some of the things that you'll run into that, that are different. And they're all relatively small, but I want to go ahead and mention them so that you're aware of them. So for example, the UI button. Buttons created from the UI button class are now borderless. You'll have no background by default. Also, if you create them programmatically, the UI button type rounded rect for the rounded rectangle style has been deprecated. If you use it in iOS 7, your rounded rect button type will resort in a system button type being used. So just be aware of that. In the UI bar button item, it's very similar to uh, UI button. Uh, bar buttons are also borderless, defaulting to the new UI bar button item style plane. In addition to the style changes for the new iOS 7 look and feel, uh, a UI alert view no longer is going to support customization by a sub view. Segmented controls in iOS 7 are now transparent and support a tint color. The tint color is used for the text and border color. When a segment is selected, the color is swapped between the background and the text with the tint color used to highlight the selected segment. The API for picker views is pretty much unchanged. However, iOS 7 design guidelines now state picker views should be presented inline rather than as input views animated from the bottom of the screen or via a new controller pushed into a navigation controller stack. The search bar is now shown inside the navigation bar when the UI search display controller display search bar in navigation bar property is set to true. The APIs around a UI table view are mainly unchanged. However, the style has changed dramatically to conform to the new user interface designs. The internal view hierarchy is also somewhat different. This change won't affect most apps, but it's just something to be aware of. So the Xcode iOS design surface has undergone a couple of improvements. So first off, there is Auto Layout. Auto Layout is a technology that's going to allow developers to create a single user interface which automatically adjusts to screen size, orientation, and localization. And then there's Asset Management. Apps are composed of many types of images and Xcode is going to allow you to bundle all that up into where it's a little bit easier to work with. And thankfully, the Xamarin guys have taken the Xcode asset management and now they're able to use that, have that inside of Xamarin Studio. Now, we're going to switch over to some code and take a look at some of these updates. All right, here we are and we're over in Xamarin Studio. And what I've done is I have created a uh, simple single view application inside Xamarin Studio. All right, so you notice everything pretty much looks the same. We've got our app delegate, uh, we've got our info p list, we've got our uh, CS file for our UI view controller, we've got our zib. 
So let's go ahead and what we're going to do here is I want to show you just a couple of changes that are in Xcode that you want to pay attention to if you use Xcode to create your uh, user interfaces. So first thing is you always want to select the assistant editor and then we've got this column here and we want to change this to our um, header file okay because the header file is where we're going to be able to easily create our um, outlets alright so for example I had another button that I had gone and dragged in here then I can easily bring that guy over here okay now I'm not gonna do that I'm just gonna go and delete it but notice that I've got two outlets already over here I've got a BTN a button outlet and a label an LBL outlet okay I'm gonna go ahead I'm gonna close this guy out then if I was going to go over in here into our view did load I could go and I could say okay on my button touch up inside create I always like to create general methods because I think that dotnet developers tend to understand that more um, and then I could say okay uh, text equals string dot format something like clicked at and then I could say date time dot now dot uh, to short time string something like that and so then when I go and I uh, start this guy up he comes up inside of um, my simulator and well if I had made my label bigger we would see the uh, output so let's go through so we want to make our example a little bit better Let's make our label a little bit bigger. Oops. Yeah. Obviously, I had too much clicking on that. So, let's bring Xcode back up. Make this guy a little bit bigger. Wanted to could also change the text should have done that probably the first time move the label around a little bit let's go let's save it go exit from Xcode bring up Xamarin Studio there it is I'm make sure that it picks up all of the previous changes Hopefully, if I've done everything correctly, that clean, the update, we should get some. There we go. And so you can see, there it is. It's clicked at 12:13. So that actually shows one thing that's an improvement. Older versions of Mono Develop and Xamarin Studio didn't necessarily always pick up those kind of changes, and you would literally have to exit out of Xamarin Studio, go back in for it to pick up all the changes. All right. Now I've switched over into another project and I just want to show another example of existing code running in iOS 7. And so specifically in this example, I've got a date picker. Okay. And in that date picker, it's set up, uh, it's just put on into a zip file. You'll see this in um, Xcode. And here it's coming up, and there it is. Okay, so you can see that this guy's here. It's just been popped into a uh, view, and that gets saved off, and we'll go and work with that guy here. So here it is. I'm just gonna go and set some properties and then act on them. Specifically, I'm gonna set the min date, I'm gonna set the max date, go ahead and set some 
uh, default date, you know, those kind of things. It's very simple. As the date picker changes, then I'm going to update a label. So very, very simple kind of stuff. But it just shows that all of my existing APIs are working over in iOS 7. So here it is, and you can see what date that I'm actually recording this. So I go, oops, let's set that to December. And then notice that it honors the min and the max as well. So if I went and tried to set those to, you can see that it goes to the maximum date as well. All right, so that's just, you know, showing my date pickers working exactly the same as before.